Thank you for joining me again for part three in our series regarding youngsters who are outwardly defiant or inwardly so, as we sometimes term it, unmotivated. I'm Tom McIntyre, and in part three, we'll be discussing the why, the reasons behind the defiant, non-cooperative behavior. So let me ask you right up front, why does that kid keep doing that? Think of a youngster who you would term as being uncooperative. Why did that youngster engage in that non-cooperative behavior? And oftentimes we personalize it. Why did that kid do that to me? While you're devising your list of various causations, allow me to project down the screen some oftentimes mentioned etiologies. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that one too. Or perhaps it might be one of these. Um, might be. Could be. Oh. oh, mimes. I don't know how they're involved, but I know they are. There's something really creepy about those folks. You've had the opportunity now to consider what might be causing that behavior. What's on your list? Perhaps, as some teachers phrase it, the youngsters are uncivilized. What is behind the words is that we have some children who unfortunately did not receive the guidance in their young lives to help them develop an ethical, moral value system to help them develop an appropriate pattern of behavior. Others, though, have learned alternative correct ways to behave in certain situations. Who are these youngsters who are at risk for poor life outcomes? They tend to fall into three categories. Kids who come from areas of multi-generational poverty. While understanding that the vast majority of kids who come from those homes are raised well, there is an overrepresentation of dysfunctional, disorganized homes that fail to provide our children with the moral, ethical value system and appropriate behavior pattern that is needed for success in mainstream society. I hear teachers say if only they'd learn right behavior they could stop being poor. Not realizing that the multi-generationally wealthy oftentimes look down on middle-class blokes like me and say oh if only they could learn refined behavior they could be accepted in higher society. Allow me to regale you with a story. I was once invited to a knighting ceremony. A colleague of mine was going to be knighted into an international order. I was invited to attend and be at his side. It was quite an honor and a privilege. I had a chance to meet Sir Kenneth, the head of the knight order, who said to me, Oh, Tom, what is it that you do? And I said, well, I'm a uh, professor of special education just down the road there at Hunter College. Oh, yes, noble endeavor, noble endeavor. And I said, Sir Kenneth, what is your career? Oh, he looked offended. He said, no one in my family has worked for 400 years. Well, that was like waving a red flag in front of a bull default response when you come from a blue-collar town like me? Stimulus response? Here was prime material for a poke in the ribs. No one in my family has worked for 400 years. To which I responded, wow, that's 20 generations of welfare. I couldn't help myself. It's my ingrained behavior pattern and value system code. Instead of receiving a verbal jab back, as would have happened in my factory town, I was witness to the shock look on his face as he quickly recovered, though, and said, Tom, please avail yourself of the culinary delights over on the table. 
I suspect that in his mind the barbarians were at the wall, and one had scaled them and breached the inner sanctum. Another group of kids who are at risk for not faring well within the school building would be our kids who are culturally different, who are raised in traditional ways that have worked well for that cultural group for thousands upon thousands of years. But that right way of behaving when it enters the schoolhouse is in opposition to the expectations found within. Recent immigrant families, kids who come from other parts of the world, are also at risk for having their right ways to do things become wrong. And so we meet kids who do not have the responses that we would expect in the various situations found within the school. As we look at other reasons, perhaps it's something inborn, perhaps it's the nature of the beast, so to speak. Most of us forget what it's like to be a kid, except on weekends. But there are some characteristics that are common, in fact expected at certain ages, that can spawn behavior that is viewed by adults as being defiant, disruptive, non-cooperative, or unmotivated. An awareness of these expected age-based traits can help us develop greater tolerance. It will remind us to use positive and respectful interventions that teach, yes, teach appropriate ways to react in situations, helping kids become cultural chameleons, so to speak, keeping their valued ways for the home and the neighborhood and around friends who also have those traditional ways, but being able to switch gears, so to speak, when they enter into the mainstream society which school represents. Perhaps you're working with kids in the 6 to 12 year age group. If so, what are some of the common developmental characteristics of youngsters of that age? Here are some of them. They want to know what the limits are in your classroom, in your setting. For their own psychological comfort, they want to know what's considered to be acceptable behavior. And when they're asking why, they truly want to know. They want to understand why it is that things are done differently here than in other places, other life spaces. Kids of this age tend to be very egocentric. Everything should revolve around me. I want that now. I'd like to do things on my own time schedule. Yes, I know you're trying to help me understand how others see things, but when I walk in others' shoes, it's still my own feet that I feel. They want the exception clause applied to them. Why do I have to do that? Even though in our minds, it's fair to expect this of all children. But when we do try to promote compliance, have these youngsters do what everybody else is doing, they often think we're picking on them. And of course this plays out as being possessive and impulsive. In many of their minds, it's my world and you're just living in it. Perhaps you work with or plan to work with teenagers. There we're talking about kids who have increased cognitive, social, and physical skills. They want more influence, they want more say in what happens in their lives. Now the peer group has exceeded adults in importance. They will do things to gain the acceptance of those they perceive highly. They'll attempt to get positive attention from those to whom they're romantically attracted. And their greatest fear? Rejection by peers. They become hypersensitive to criticism, especially public shaming. That could be traumatic. They need to present the appearance of being highly competent. I know this already. Their goal is to project the appearance of being highly capable. They fear rejection by peers. Being shamed in front of the peer group is traumatizing. 
For boys, the frontal lobe of the brain is probably still developing. This is the part of the brain that's involved in abstract thinking, observing safety in situations, being aware and concerned about the feelings of others. This is the stage where we see a lot of the extreme behavior, what apparently is unsafe behavior, but also just not understanding how their actions have impacted others. Hey, I was just joking. What's the problem? Come on, you got no humor? Failing to realize that others didn't see that behavior as humorous. Anything that is unrelated to their personal interests is boring. But you know what? Sometimes it is boring in the classroom. What role does the teacher play in defiance, non-cooperation, lack of motivation? When we return to part four of this series of podcasts, we'll be looking at how educators and others oftentimes create the very behaviors they complain about. I'm Tom McIntyre, Dr. Mac of BehaviorAdvisor.com. Please join me for the next installment in our series regarding defiance and motivation.